we've talked before about potential successors to Boris Johnson. And one of the names that has come up along many of the others that have uh, obviously popped up over the years, we've obviously had Michael Gove be one of them mentioned a couple of times. Uh, Rishi Sunak, who we're going to be talking about today, mostly because of um, the, quote, success of the furlough scheme, which was something that he did not want to actually do to begin with. I think he only really put it in because um, I think it would look really bad, obviously, if people were losing their jobs left, right and centre, and the government did nothing about it. Like I say, it was pretty much a time where he had to act, and of course, Sunak got a lot of praise for that. But of course, you have Pretty Patel, who has been really, again, out on, um, on, on truck, really. We had a bizarre moment where she had a, a home office, um, like, jacket printed up, and she went out on an immigrant raid, as if she was personally catching the immigrants herself. Um, you know, all she needed was a big net, and it would be complete. <laughs> And of course, one of the other surprise ones that has been coming up a lot recently is, of course, Liz Truss, partly because she's been doing these, quote, trade deals. And again, they aren't trade deals. They are basically rollover deals, which probably end up worse than what we originally had. Again, see my videos when we've talked about the Japan deal, the Australia deal, and soon to probably be announced, uh, the New Zealand deal as well. Like I say... Uh, she's getting a lot of, shall we say, credit where she doesn't really deserve the credit because she's doing a copy and paste job, <laughs> literally. Um, and again, once people realize the damage that these, shall we say, trade deals are actually done, um, again, just like Sunak this autumn, she's going to lose a lot of popularity. But we are going to talk about why Boris is so scared at the moment of Rishi Sunak, because again, there have been a bit of rumours that Sunak has been out on manoeuvres. And of course, there is a big precedent, especially over the past couple of decades, shall we say, of the guy in number 11, eventually, shall we say, taking over the seat in number 10. So Boris, shall we say, is be wearing be wearing, <laughs> wary, should we say, of being stabbed in the back. But of course, Boris himself has been, shall we say, the stabber, not the stabby in more recent times. And it looks like maybe his time is indeed coming. So before we do jump into today's article, please do remember to hit that like share and subscribe button and of course down below there are links to my uh, patreon page as well as the one-off donation link called buy me coffee where you can well buy me coffee and as always thank you very much to all the people who do support the channel that way so this comes from the guardian and the title is why boris johnson is getting resentful and paranoid about rishi sunak the prime minister has cemented his reputation as a careless pair of hands and a leader of the opposition has struggled to try and make his voice heard. There is only one senior British politician that has got through the past 18 months with a constant positive approval ratings from both the voters and his party members. So take a bow, Rishi Sunak. The humiliating exit from Afghanistan is further entrenching his standing among Conservative MPs, if only because he, had, uh, he has dis uh, dismissed uh, has diminished in the stature of rivals. The Tory backbenchers who queued up to lambast the Prime Minister in the Commons have seen further evidence that Boris Johnson is not good in a crisis. Reputational damage has also been inflicted on the Prime Minister's titular deputy and Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab. If a contest to be the next leader of the Conservative Party will be to held, would be held tomorrow, the Chancellor would be the man to bet on. Which is why his highly exposed, uh, it was a highly exposed position to actually be in. When an heir apparent is all too apparent, he starts to attract a coterie, hoping to try and prosper by clinging to his coattails. He also ferments envy among the peaked colleagues and breeds suspicion and distrust in number 10. The Prime Minister likes to hear one of the cabinet being described as a successor. It reminds him that they are, of course, mortal. Tony Blair and his, um, and his staff 
generated uh, generated gigawatts of very nervous energy trying to work out whether Gordon Brown, a powerful chancellor, uh, ravenous to move next door, was on the manoeuvres, as was he very often was. In the late 1960s, Harold Wilson's paranoia levels spiked whenever Roy Jenkins received positive reviews for his helmsmanship of the Treasury. The relationship between Margaret Thatcher and Nigel Lawson, erstwhile ideologue soulmates, deteriorated to such bitterness that the eventual resignation and his exit from the Treasury began the chain of events that led to a downfall just a year later. As in that case, sometimes fissures over policy drive apart the Downing Street neighbours, and on other occasions the struggle just boils down to who wields power and what was the root of the most uh, Bra uh, Blair Brown uh, psycho psychodramas. Policy, power and personality are all playing a role in rising tensions between the current pairing in Downing Street. One reason Mr Johnson is currently resentful of Mr Sunak is that he was not the Chancellor that the Prime Minister thought he was getting when he, uh, when he promoted the much younger man to number 11. His expectations that he would uh, that he would be an undershow and a plant next door neighbour, while rubber stamping all the checks the prime minister wanted to cash to make himself popular, Mr. Johnson would be the great showman and a modest chancellor would stay behind the scenes, dutifully handing over the treasury spreadsheets, making up the numbers, and eventually. Mr. Sunak, always keen on self promotion, with the talent of charming Tory MPs. He is much more liked than the Prime Minister currently is, and no one believes him when he protests that he has no ambition to reach the very apex of the greasy pole. He has grown far more confident in throwing the Treasury's substantial weight around in battles, with often this, the dysfunctional number 10. Internal policy disputes have repeatedly surfaced in the media over recent months, always a sign of rising stress and fraying collective dispute in Downing Street. The arguments have ranged for who should pay for the reform on social care and how to fund the, uh, the greening of homes and what to do about the pension triple lock. In more than one case, the Chancellor's view seems to have prevailed over that of the Prime Minister. When the relationship goes sour, there's very often the trivial spats that reveal the most. Earlier this month, the Sunday Times reported that the Prime Minister had received a letter from the Chancellor in which the latter argued for substantive easing of the COVID-related travel restrictions to try and help the economy, a position very popular among Conservative MPs, who Mr Sunak spends a lot of time wooing. The Prime Minister was reported to be apolytic about the received uh, uh, of what was a relatively minor leak, not because he was opposed to loosening the travel rules, but because the leak appeared and des was designed to make it as if the dithering Prime Minister needed a push from the decisive next-door neighbour. The Prime Minister told a meeting with aides that he was toying with demoting Sunak. Maybe it's time we look at Rishi as the next Secretary of State for Health. Some dismissed this as more than a, a Johnsonian jest or just a passing temper tantrum. The different thought occurred to me when I learned about the remark about the evicting Mr Sunak from number 11 was witnessed by more than a dozen people. Mr Johnson is a journalist who has made his provocative suggestion to a large audience of people who talk to journalists. I reckon he expected it to reach the public domain and was happy for it to do so in a way that was sharply reminding his neighbour about who was the boss. Allies of the Chancellor then retorted that rather than accepting a demotion, he would just quit the cabinet and sit on the back benches waiting for Mr Johnson to fall. Another aggravation for the Prime Minister is in the way in which he has been relentlessly pummeled for his handling of the pandemic. While the Chancellor has been largely unscathed by the criticism, even when he was responsible for some of the egregious blunders. He is eat out to help out scheme last summer was casually referred to as Eat, uh, eat out to help the virus. But some government scientific advisors put all the blame for the disease's resurgence and labelled Mr. Uh, labeled it on Mr. Johnson. He was certainly extremely culpable for it, though. And according to a retelling of, by a retelling of Dominic Cummings, the Prime Minister was so resistant to further lockdowns that he was prepared to let the bodies pile high. Yet, 
there have been many points in the pandemic where the chancellor was pressing so aggressively for COVID restrictions to come off that he wanted to take risks with the virus that even alarmed Mr. Johnson. So much that I am told the prime minister was heard to refer to the treasury as the pro-death squad. Jealousy may be another factor at work, of course. Mr. Johnson has personal mummy troubles, are a persistent topic of conversation among his friends and a source of stories that generate a stink. And of course, Mr. Sunak, a former investment banker married to a daughter of a billionaire, potentially let it to be known that no Tory donors are involved when his Downing Street flat was refurbished. The Treasury declared that the bill was paid from his own deep pockets. The richest MP in the Commons, he has just received a planning permission to put in a swimming pool, a gym and a tennis court in the Grade 2 listed manor house where he lives in the North Yorkshire constituency. And that will do um, and this will do as a, quote, a fermicile of checkers until he actually gets the chance to be in the real thing. The further source of grievance for the prime minister among some of the cabinet ministers is whether the chancellor was deft at pocketing up the popularity that he gained from the COVID emergency measures, but artfully tries to serve the Ouroboram of people who are left disappointed by his decisions. After the Treasury refused to cough up for the school's catch-up programme devised by the Prime Minister's advisor, who then promptly resigned in protest, most of the fire was directed at number 10 and the hapless Education Secretary. It is against this very background of paranoia and recrimination in Downing Street that the government is heading into this autumn, during which the spending and debt will dominate the highly diverse of issues. The bill for the pandemic, which is already coming in the north of around £400 billion, has added massively to the government borrowing. While at the same time, there is a host of demands for more spending to try and tackle the COVID legacy. The NHS has a huge hangover of, of postponed treatments to deal with. And of course, large numbers of cases are now backed up in the courts to take, uh, to take just two of the main examples. The autumn spending review will amplify the split between the very fiscal disciplinarians in the Tory party and those who think that there is no vice in being a big borrower in the aftermath of a crisis. This is the great fault line between the Chancellor, who is a fiscal conservative at heart, and the creakiest Prime Minister, who is ever desperate to please the crowd. Prime Ministers and Chancellors can, can navigate different differences of temperament if there is a philosophical alignment with them. They can resolve policy disputes when they trust in each other, but their relationship has been made toxic by personal resentments, ideological differences, and rival ambitions is a highly combustible cocktail. So, as I've said before, I think this autumn is going to be very, very interesting when it comes down to it. Um, the budget talks are going to be very, very interesting when those come out. Um, the battle lines are going to be drawn between, as we've said before, between the MPs that want to level up, between those that want the Global Britain, the MPs with the North versus those in the South. It's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun, I can tell you that much. Um, like I say, and all this is going to kick off very, very soon. Very, very soon indeed. So, as always, if you want to stay tuned to this upcoming battlefield of UK politics is about to happen, then of course, please remember to hit that subscribe button. And of course, remember to hit that bell as well so that you get uh, announcements when I upload the new videos, because I'm sure you want to see the aftermath of some of these fights. They're going to happen. And trust me, they will spill out into, shall we say, the pages of the newspapers very, very quickly. Because like I say, a lot of Tories are sharpening their pitchforks and swords, preparing to go to a war. So, as always, please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button. And, of course, down below, there are links to my Patreon page and a one-off donation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can, well, buy me coffee. And, as always, thank you very much to the people who do support the channel that way. And, of course, we'll see you all 